Let me put it this way. Yeah. If, if I went back in time with a Panasonic video camera, would the little LCD screen show a man walk out of that tomb? I would say suspect yes. Whoa! Hi, I'm Glenn from Speak Life. We like to see all things through the lens of Jesus. It's a question that Jordan Peterson famously doesn't like being asked. People often ask me, do you believe in God? Which I don't, I don't like that question. Yeah, I don't like the question. I don't like that question. I find it an off-putting question. The reason I don't like to answer it is because A, I don't like to be boxed in, and B, because I don't know what the person means by believe or God, and they think they know. Does he believe in God? Undeterred, cosmic skeptic, who goes now by his Christian name, Alex O'Connor, went on to Jordan Peterson's podcast to ask the very same question. Does he believe in God? God. And Jordan Peterson answers with almost as many caveats as he ordinarily does, except I think Alex O'Connor has his man. I think he's finally pinned down Jordan Peterson on the issue of belief in God and on the issue of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's see how it happened. Alex O'Connor summarizes Jordan Peterson's teaching that we all need meaning, that we are all orienting our lives towards a highest value, and at the top of the hierarchy of values, there necessarily has to be a transcendent ideal and let's call that God. Here is Alex summarizing Jordan Peterson's teaching. You said at least on, on one occasion that we'll call that place, whatever's at the top there, we'll call it the divine place. Yeah, and you said right. we'll make that a, that's matter, a matter of definition. Of definition. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm kind of, I'm fine with this, yeah. but it seems to me that, that what you're doing is you're giving a definition of God mm -hmm. that makes him, Partial definition. or makes it, him, whatever, unavoidably exist and also makes it a quite different entity to the entity described by a great deal of, for instance, your Christian, uh, your Christian listeners, who will say that God is not the, the basis of a value hierarchy. Mm -hmm. God is an omnipotent, omniscient, agential being with mm -hmm. consciousness that intentionally brings about human beings and sent down a physical man to sacrifice his life in order mm -hmm. to save us from our sins. Now, that means that when someone asks you, does God exist? And you say, well, look, I, I think that's a, that's almost an inappropriate question. I, I, in, at times you sort of imply that you don't even believe in atheists because you sort of act as if you believe in God. Mm -hmm. If what you mean by God is just... Well, Dawkins himself admitted he was a cultural Christian. That's, like that's another matter, because that's much more specific. I mean, that's yeah. cultural Christianity, yeah, right? This yeah, is just... Yeah. This, but although but it's been, a reflection been saying of that the same years. problem. But, but, you know, when, someone, when a Christian says to you, I, I'm being very clear that that's what I mean by God. I don't know if you do believe in the omniscient, omnipotent, agential being, but... Mm. If you start talking about the inevitability of believing in some basis of a value well, it's hierarchy, not so obvious. you're talking it's about something different. It's not so obvious to me. from the traditional Judeo-Christian perspective that God is properly conceptualized as a being. That's that's so, probably right well, too. So, so first of all, Alex says uh, Jordan Peterson's definition of God makes God into an inescapable entity, uh, a, a being that cannot not exist. Um, I don't think that's actually a problem. Um, I, I don't mind arguments for God's existence along the lines of the ontological argument for God's existence, in which God simply is this this necessary being. I don't think that's a problem. Um, it might be a problem if you insist that every argument for God's existence must hold his existence in abeyance to begin with, and we must agree on a neutral space in which the universe may or may not have a creator, and you must therefore lead the skeptic step by step towards uh, belief in God's existence. Um, I, I think that is to privilege skepticism from the outset, because if God does exist, then we simply do not live in a universe that is like the one that we are assuming at the start of the argument. So I, I don't mind arguments for God's existence that assume God from the outset. That might make me frustrating to deal with if you're a skeptic. Um, you might want to call me a fideist at that point. I don't think I am, but um, I can understand why it's frustrating to be told that there is a necessary being and that all other contingent beings are related to and dependent upon the necessary being. You might find that frustrating, but the Christian finds it frustrating when an atheist assumes that God is an add-on to creation. <laughs> And that what we will assume is ourselves, our own consciousness, maybe the external world, and then we start to wonder whether a being outside the external world exists. Um, that, to the Christian, is the frustrating thing, because obviously, if reality is anything like what Christians say it is, that is not how reality is. We are the add-on, not God. <laughs> we are the questionable ones, not God. And so I, I understand why it's frustrating to think of God as a necessary being if you don't think of God as a necessary being. I also want to make the case that you can't talk about God without talking about a necessary being. <laughs>
So that's one point in Peterson's favor. But I think a point in Alex O'Connor's favor is you can talk about a necessary being all you like. Are, are we really talking about the triune God of Scripture? Are we really talking about the Father who has revealed himself in Christ the Son by the power of the Spirit? Are we talking about what Christians are talking about? Or are we talking about Spinoza's God? Or are we talking about a deist's God? We, we, what are we actually talking about here? And, and Alex is going to try and pin Peterson down, and, and Peterson's a bit slippery on this. Let's see. Not so obvious from the traditional Judeo-Christian perspective that God is properly conceptualized as a being. That's, that's so, probably right. Well, so Peterson goes to, okay, God is not a being among other beings, which is something that is absolutely in the history of Christian theology and Jewish theology. Um, certainly in the high Middle Ages, uh, you'd get Maimonides uh, from a Jewish perspective. You get Thomas Aquinas from, um, from the medieval Catholic perspective saying that God is not one more character in the character list of the play. God is like Shakespeare. He is not one more being among other beings. He is not one more item in the meta metaphysical furniture list of the universe. He is the creator of all. He is the source of all being. He is not a super being. And so if this is what Peterson means at this point, then he is indeed um, in line with a, a whole lot of very weighty Christian theology. It's tricky, right? Because yeah. one of the ways that you can approach God traditionally is in relationship to a being, but that's mm -hmm. a veil. Okay, and this is where I'm going to have problems with Jordan Peterson. If your relationship with the being who encounters you in history and in scripture, if that encounter is a veil, what we've then done is make everything in the gospel actually a mask that prevents you from believing in the true God who stands behind those gospel events. Um, whereas actually the revelation of God in Christ is precisely the solution to the problem that Jordan Peterson is setting up here. Um, God would be unknowable except for the Father is made known in the Son. And Jesus says, when you see him, you are seeing the Father. When you know him, you are knowing the Father. And that I and the Father are one. These are comments that are all throughout John's Gospel. Jesus comes to us in history, not as a veil for God, but as the very revelation of God, the very face of God. So when Christ comes to us and acts towards us in history and in bleeding and dying for us and rising again, that is not a veil. That is not obscuring who God is. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father, says Jesus in John chapter 14. Therefore, Jesus is the way to God. He is not in the way of God. And it seems to me like if Jordan Peterson wants to simply posit a, a necessary being in whose universe we, we simply must exist, um, he might be making that God into a prisoner of his own transcendence, a God who cannot make himself known without denying himself. And yet the doctrine of the Trinity says that God is not denying himself in making himself known. He is pouring himself out in revelation as he reveals himself in Christ. This, this I think might be a, a, a dis disagreement that I have with, with Peterson here. People say, is God real? Which is a variant of the question, is do you believe in God? It's like, mm. well, God's immaterial and outside of time and space. So if your definition of real is material things yep. in the domain of time and space, then we're not talking about the same thing. And people like Thomas Aquinas will say things like, God is not a thing in the world. He's not one more character to point to in the character list, true. Now, usually, People approach that question of belief with some materialistic framework like that in mind, even if they don't know it. Yes. The Christians, let's say, um, who put this question forward in the hope of getting the answer they want to hear are materialistic and enlightenment minds, even though they don't know it. I think that's absolutely true. I think there are a lot of Christians who want to prove God's existence the same way you would go about proving Bigfoot's existence. You know, you, you just want to go to the spot and like capture him on a Panasonic camera, let's say. Uh, we'll get into Panasonic cameras in a second. But um, I think there are a lot of Christians who kind of almost assume the flying spaghetti monster view of who God is. And Richard Dawkins, you know, says, I don't believe in God and I don't believe in the flying spaghetti monster either. Or Bertrand Russell says, you know, I have no idea whether there's a, like a teapot circling Jupiter or however he puts it in um, why I'm not a Christian. Um, 
is is God one more object in the universe that you can scour the universe for and kind of either uh, accept or reject his existence? God, God is not like that. He is not a thing in the universe. And Peterson is right. There are lots of Christians who treat God's existence in that manner. Um, and that is a, a materialistic um, enlightenment kind of way of dealing with the world. He's absolutely right about that. Mm. Because they have an implicit definition of what constitutes real. Is God real? It's like, no, no, God's hyper real. That's not the same thing. I think that the, the mm -hmm. physicality of God like is that. an interesting question. Yeah. In, the, in the Old Testament tradition, it seems to evolve as, as far as I can see. It. God is more real than real. He is hyper real. I can totally get on board with that. And then the conversation gets on to the Old Testament and development within the Old Testament into the New Testament and the Gospels. And Alex is going to land on the historicity of Jesus. And did he rise again from the dead? And I think that is where we can really earth the conversation of, is the Christian God the one who is really there or not? And Alex does his best to nail down Peterson on that issue. And I think he does a great job. I think a lot of people interpret Paul, for example, um, uh, the earliest New Testament source, as saying that if Jesus did not literally rise from the dead, Mm -hmm. if, if there was not a man who stopped breathing and then started breathing again, then your faith is futile and you're still mm -hmm. in your sins. That is, Christianity is undermined. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. that means that, and Paul doesn't say sort of believing that that's false is really bad. He says, if you do not believe this proactively, yeah. then your faith is, yeah, is futile. Yeah, the problem so, I so have with if, that. If you don't proactively yeah. believe that yourself, then I think when a Christian asks you, you know, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Are you a Christian? I think you must be committed to saying no, at least under that interpretation of Paul. Mm -hmm. and, and, and even if you're not sure, I mean, it's fine if, if I say to you, do you think that a man physically rose from the dead? And you say something like, well, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't there, but mm -hmm. I think it has a lot of mythological significance, or I think that maybe it, it happened in a, in a different sense, or it happened in the sense that good fiction happens, you mm -hmm. know, then fine. But it needs to begin with that caveat of, of the simple sort of, mm -hmm. historically speaking, I don't know. And I know you don't like to pull out the historical well, oh, Jesus well, that, and the mythological. That's a, that's but, a good objection. But it's, <laughs> it's a very good objection. And Alex is doing a brilliant job of kind of closing off different escape routes for Jordan Peterson and saying, you know, if you're going to be a Christian who is unsure of the resurrection, then you're not a very Pauline Christian, and therefore you're not an Orthodox Christian in that historic sense. So, what's it to be, Jordan Peterson? Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? It's an it's important a, question to ask. No, of course. It's a very good objection. So, the, so, I just did a seminar on the Gospels with a crew of about eight people, and it was the same crew that walked through Exodus with me, with yeah. a couple of variations. And... We spent a lot of time on the resurrection accounts, for example, and of course that was the toughest, let's say, that was the toughest morsel to chew and digest. The thing about the resurrection accounts is that they're all, look, so I could say something like this, which will just annoy people, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I believe the accounts, but I have no idea what they mean. Okay. When you say you, you believe the accounts, do you mean, and, and I, I hate to be sort of... yeah. Pedantic here, it seems pedantic, but do you mean you believe that these are things that happened such that if so I... If that's, now, that's a strange thing. I know you state. don't like that. Let me put it this way. Yeah. If, if I went back in time with a Panasonic video camera... It's got to be a Panasonic. Forget Sony. It's got to be Panasonic. Not Blackmagic. Panasonic is the one. And put that camera in front of the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. <laughs> Picks or it didn't happen. This <laughs> is like... <laughs> it's the ultimate, the ultimate Zoomer moment. Picks or it didn't happen, Jordan. What do you reckon? Would the little LCD screen show a man walk out of that tomb? I would su suspect yes. Whoa! Seriously. And look at, look at Alex. I don't think Alex was expecting. Do you think Alex was expecting that answer? I wasn't expecting that answer. <laughs> I don't think Alex was expecting that answer. I think everybody was sort of expecting him to say, I can't answer that question. It would take me three years to you know, unpack all the intricacies of it. And he just, I, I suspect on the little LCD screen, you would see Jesus alive again after death. I think that's a significant moment. And, and Alex is shocked by it. I'm kind of shocked by it. And I think it changes things, really. Obviously, Peterson is going to say what anyone would say. I don't know what that would look like. And I don't know what that would look like. You know, CCTV footage on <laughs> Easter Sunday morning of Christ. Like, what, what, is, what is that going to look like? What's he wearing? He left his grave clothes. 
neatly folded in the tomb. Like what? Like everyone's got questions. <laughs> like what, what is what is going on? What would that look like? Um, but he's saying, I suspect, based on the gospel accounts and based on a lot of study of scripture. I think he rose again. And it's interesting that 1 Corinthians 15, which is the passage where Paul insists that you must believe in the resurrection, it's also the passage that begins, Christ was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. I think that's interesting, it's, it's, which is slightly different to he was raised according to a Panasonic camera viewfinder, right? It's like, it's slightly, it's like, which is not to say that it wouldn't show up on a camera, um, I absolutely think it does. Apparently, Jordan Peterson thinks it would show up on a camera. But according to the scriptures, there, there is, and Peterson will often talk about scriptures as like these sort of spectacles, these lenses, the, the, the value structure that you use in order to view the world. When you put on scriptural lenses, you look out into the world and you start to see the world differently. And you start to believe in something like the resurrection. You start to believe in it to the point where you think, yeah, I think it would even show up on a camera as well. I think this is a significant moment. I don't know what you think. I think Peterson has been on a journey, especially since he bounced back from his massive crash and found himself on Jonathan Peugeot's channel. And he talks at that moment about how, you know, sometimes the narrative world and the, the real world, the, the historical world, touch. Sometimes the objective world and the narrative world touch. You know, that's union synchronicity. Yeah. And I've seen that many times in my own life. And so in some sense, I believe it's undeniable. You know, we have a narrative sense of the world. For me, that's been the world of morality. That's the world that tells us how to act. It's real, like we treat it like it's real. It's not the objective world, but the narrative and the objective world touch. And the ultimate example of that in principle is supposed to be Christ. But I don't know what to, and that seems to me oddly plausible. It seems like Jesus is that figure who is the intersection of the narrative world, the world of value, the world of meaning, the world of story, the metaphysical touches the physical. And of course it touches the physical at the point of Jesus Christ. And in particular, Christ in taking on himself all the frailties of, of physical life and rising up again into immortal life is the place where the physical and the metaphysical touch. And it seems like he is saying, that the, meta, the metaphysical and the physical really genuinely and historically touch in the person of Jesus as he's risen from the dead on the third day. Now, what else does that mean for, for Jordan Peterson? I don't know. But I think Alex O'Connor is shocked. <laughs> and I wonder if Jordan Peterson is surprised to hear himself say that. But let's just see this moment happen again. I, I think it's significant. And put that camera in front of the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Would the little LCD screen show a man walk out of that tomb? I would su suspect yes. And he so looks that, at that, him. Is, that to me seems like a belief in the historical event of the resurrection, or at least of Jesus leaving the tomb, which means that when somebody says, you know, do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? It doesn't seem clear to me why you're not able to just say, <laughs> it would seem to me yes. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> If that's what you think, then surely you have a, a straightforward answer. And Jordan Peterson's going to say, well, but I don't know what that means. Because I have no idea what that means. And neither did the people who saw it. Mm -hmm. Have you ever browsed in incognito mode? <laughs> and now we go to an ad. Now we go to an ad for ExpressVPN. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> it's like the yeah like i think this is the biggest moment in jordan peterson's kind of public journey about what he means about christianity and we cut to terry with the weather um but yeah so you can watch the rest of this video i i found it a fascinating video i might return to it we might do some more stuff on uh this particular interview i think both alex o'connor and jordan peterson have been their most christian selves in this uh video largely i think because they're contrarian and they've just assumed that the other person is not a christian so jordan peterson has just assumed that he's dealing with an utter skeptic and i think alex o'connor has assumed that he's dealing with somebody who doesn't really believe in the physical resurrection and so that that has because they're contrarian they always take the opposite view um i think they've brought their most christian selves 
to this interview. And it's it's fascinating. It's a fascinating time to be alive uh, when you've got a, a clinical psychologist, Jungian, talking to an anti-theist YouTuber. And my goodness, haven't they come a long way in the last 10 years? I, I, I think the God conversation has absolutely changed. And uh, I'll be very interested in seeing where things go from here. That's what I think. Have you seen this video uh, on Jordan Peterson's channel? Uh, do you have views? Uh, do you think I should pick up on some other aspects of the interview? Let me know down in the comments. I'd love to chat with you there. And if you want a Christianity 101, we've got just the thing for you. It's 321course.com. Go there now, start an account, and you can do in eight sessions Jesus' vision for God, the world, and you. It's absolutely free. We won't spam you. Do the course, and if you're a Christian, do the course, and then pass it on to friends. Uh, this means that evangelism for you is as easy as texting somebody 321course.com. That'll do us for now. Why don't you like, share, and subscribe this video, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks so much.